Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, uh, we're having a look at the benefit of thinking more strategically uh, about uh, energy intensive buildings uh, and actually how we can make uh, them more energy positive and how we can recycle uh, and reuse energy. Um, our speaker today is Chris Jones. Um, uh, Chris is our sector lead uh, on mission critical buildings in particular uh, around data centres and Chris has recently written indeed for uh, Building Magazine, uh, Property EU uh, and with Broadway Malian, um, he wrote a piece in City AM recently as well, very much around uh, how we can uh, reuse waste heat from data centres um, and the interesting emergence of edge data centres as well, uh, which he will touch on today. Our session today, uh, Chris will probably present for around about 20 minutes. Um, you can post questions uh, in the question box uh, on your screens uh, and Chris and I will both see those and we'll go through a few uh, question and answers um, at the end. We'll, we'll finish around half 11, maybe a fraction afterwards. If you're joining us today and um, you don't know that much about Hydrox, just very briefly, uh, we're a national uh, integrated uh, engineering design, energy and sustainability consultancy. And I, I would say there are kind of three key areas that we're hopefully making an impact with people. Um, trans uh, transforming workplaces, a, a great example of this, uh, the UK Hydrographic Office, which uh, in this year uh, won the best of the best. Uh, at the British Council for Offices uh, Awards uh, and we worked on that 11,000 square metre uh, headquarters office. We worked on it with our partners AHR and BAM. Um, we're transforming communities. Uh, we're setting uh, the benchmark for energy and sustainability strategies and a good example of this in the home uh, in the home counties uh, is a 180 hectare scheme uh, that will offer 2,000 homes and all the supporting community facilities, uh, which we're working on with a, a leading university uh, and a major investment fund as well. Um, and we're also transforming the way that the property sector um, can manage its assets as well more efficiently, uh, more effectively, safely and sustainably. Um, our most recent webinar was on the golden thread of information required for fire safety engineering, um, a great example of managing those assets. Um, previously, we've heard from Annie Marston uh, talking about the performance of existing buildings and the importance of a digital twin uh, and how to make uh, existing buildings perform more optimally and efficiently. Um, and we're also looking at you know, cost models as well to explore alternative forms of energy, renewable energy, uh, the generation of it, the connectivity, um, and very importantly, the storage as well, and helping clients to understand those financial cost models um, to potentially unlock uh, sites and to make them more feasible and sustainable. So they are some of the kind of areas we're working on in terms of transforming uh, communities, um, the workplace um, and future energy generation as well. But today, as I say, it's about uh, energy intensive buildings, making them more energy positive and the reuse uh, of energy as well. And so I'm going to hand you over now uh, to Chris, um, who's going to present for the next 15 minutes or so on that. So thank you, Chris. OK, yeah, th thank you, Rem. Um, yeah, um, hello, everyone. I uh, hope, uh, hope you're well. Uh, thanks for um, joining us. Um, yeah, so really just going to talk about my thoughts on really reusing waste energy from from different building types. Um, as Graham mentioned, I am a, a technical director within Hydrock and I really lead the mission critical sector uh, for the for the business. And at the moment, at least, I'm, I'm really focusing on on on, on data centres since lockdown. Um, the, the development of, of data centres has significantly increased um, in use and yeah we're seeing a, a lot of business um, uh, within the sector. So to, to start off with and, and really to set the scene um, I think we've all listened to COP26 um, in the last couple of months and there's been lots of talk about how we're going to try and reduce and keep global temperatures to sort of 1.5 degrees there's really not been a lot of uh, granularity as to how we're actually going to achieve that in, in, in practice. You know, a lot of our built environment has been developed over the last hundred years um, and you know, business as usual really isn't sustainable. So we need to think of, 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 of how we can meet our objectives. And I think the real driver that we need to aim for is, is to not only just be consumers of energy, but to be producers and recyclers of energy in an integrated and holistic way. And, and the rest of this, this uh, session will really just talk about some of my ideas as to how maybe we, we can achieve that. 
Um, so to start off with, obviously, what I've got here is is really the old um, lean mean green triangle, which has been used, you know, in, you know, for numerous years. But what we've done is really add um, a, another layer to that, and that's reuse and, re and recycle energy before we try and offset. And I think that's really the missing link at the moment. And what we want to try and highlight really is the fact that the technologies to reuse and recycle energy are already available. And it's really just a matter of put, pulling all the pieces together and, and ensuring that they're used um, in, in, in a constructive way. Um, one of the main technologies that I think will really help us uh, reuse and recover energy is, is Ambient Leap or, or, or fifth generation district heating networks. What essentially they are are simply pipes in the ground that connect loads of different building types together. Each building type has a heat pump in it rather than a gas boiler or, 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 or another type of heating source or, or cooling source. And the heat pump allows transfer of energy both into the loop and, and out from the loop. So if you have different types of buildings which have a net excess of energy, which would normally be rejected to uh, atmosphere, that can instead be in injected into the ambient loop via the heat pump. Um, different building types, such as dwellings, who have a net in intake of energy generally, can then take energy from that ambient loop via the heat pump and, 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 and use that heat, uh, use that heat um, e e effectively. Um, in order to uh, balance peaks um, in, in load what on the ambient loop, um, storage can be included within the ambient loop. So if you've got an industrial process which is churning out heat 24 hours a day, that um, heat can be stored within the water within the ambient loop and, 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 and will meet those, those, those peak demands. Um, ambient loops can also be used within buildings. Um, the example on the screen here is, is the Dimplex Xerox system, which has been developed for uh, residential properties, where you've got a heat pump within each building or in each apartment, which both generates hot water and uh, heating for the building. It can also be used for cooling as well, if you reverse the heat pump. And each of the heat pump units are connected to an ambient loop or a condenser water circuit loop within the building. And that can then be connected um, to a heat pump, which can either inject heat into the loop or reject heat out of the loop. Um, and they can also be connected into district heating networks as well. So this is all commercially available and, and it really is a real good driver to, to um, reduce energy, energy consumption within, within domestic buildings. Obviously, whilst we're talking about uh, reducing uh, or reusing and recycling energy, the most important thing we can do is, is to reduce any energy consumption in the first place. Now, Passive House has been around for a number of years and it's really not been mainstream uh, in, 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 in construction, but we're seeing a, a huge uptake in, in the use of Passive House technology. For those of you who are not particularly familiar with it, it's really just really good design, high insulation, high thermal, um, uh, high thermal tightness, uh, low thermal bridging, really efficient um, energy recovery systems to minimise the, the amount of energy that we're consuming uh, within within buildings. And, and this can be both for domestic and commercial buildings. Uh, there are a number of different passive house classes, um, but, but typically uh, a, a, a typically built new passive house dwelling uses approximately one tenth of the energy of a typical domestic building within the UK. Conversely, you know, 10 passive house buildings, you know, can consume the same as, as, as one, one building nowadays. So by minimising our energy use and using renewable energy and, and recovering energy from, from other types of building uses is really the way that we can try and meet our, our zero carbon objectives. Now, as, as I said, I, I tend to work within the uh, in, in the data centre sector currently, and one of the things I've really developed is 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 the the concept of the data centre as, as as a thermal battery. So, for those of you who don't are pretty unclear as to what a data centre is, it's effectively a building, effectively just full of servers. Those servers can fulfil a number of uses. It could be um, things that are driving teams now. It could be things that run your bank. It could be servers that run run your Netflix when you when you um, produce uh, when you click on a, on a film but all of those servers effectively end up having to um, get rid of their excess heat typically at the moment that's rejected to atmosphere and data centers nowadays are, are getting considerably larger in size so 10 years ago a, a, a data center would typically be between 5 and 10 megawatts in size 
now they're on average between 50 and 100 megawatts. Um, I'm looking at sites already which are around 160 megawatts in size. Um, just to give you a comparison, a 100 megawatt data centre has the same electrical load of around 33,000 three bedroom homes. So as you can see, these, these buildings consume vast amounts of energy. Um, an example of a project we've been working on for a number of years now is, is the Langley Business Centre and, and this was an existing industrial site in Slough uh, which we uh, reserved power for and got planning permission for, for data centre use. Um, as part of the planning uh, process we engaged quite heavily with the uh, local authority and, and one of the main reasons that we were able to gain um, planning permission for the site was the ability to recover and reuse dist uh, district um, energy into a future district heating network. Uh, if we weren't able to do that, we probably wouldn't have been able to get planning permission for the site. Um, just to give you an overview of the, of the project, uh, we reserved 130 megawatts of electrical supply um, uh, to the site and the building had a 100 megawatt IT load. Um, as you can see, there's lots of high voltage supplies, lots of generators, um, but the district heating study that we um, developed uh, to support the planning application demonstrated that we could probably recover upwards of 20 megawatts of heat from that building 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we estimated that that could supply around 9,000 new build homes, um, a, a, a local college and the local Wexham Park Hospital. Uh, which, which demonstrated to, to, to Slough Borough Council, who was the, um, the planning authority, that you know this could significantly, consistently help them meet their climate emergency, which at the time they'd only just issued. Um, in order to facilitate the, the, the energy recovery from the data centre, we, we used a, a water-based uh, cooling technology. Um, and obviously the data centre needs to operate as, as a standalone solution. And the, the only added components we added to the um, to the system was a set of plate, plate heat exchangers which allowed uh, water at around 40 to 45 degrees to be rejected via the plate heat exchanger to a co-located energy centre on the site. The plan was to then take that uh, water at around 43 degrees, elevate it to a higher temperature via another set of heat pumps and then put it out on, on, onto a district heating uh, network. With this particular application, we had to um, we had to agree to effectively give the heat away for free uh, to the planners. It was part of the uh, the deal we made to get planning application, but in essence, that heat has a has a has a value. So any any operator who normally would reject you know waste heat to atmosphere can actually start you know treating that as an energy source and and and, and potentially as a revenue stream. Um, just a little bit of uh, geeky data on, on um, uh, data centres now. There are a couple of suitable uh, data hall technologies um, uh, that can be used for heat recovery. Uh, typically, these need to be water based uh, purely because um, water has a very high specific heat capacity, so it can absorb a lot of energy per degree temperature rise of water and is much more suitable than, than air technology. Um, one advent uh, uh, te te uh, technology that will really drive, I think, the ability to recover large amounts of heat from data centres is dielectric uh, immersion cooling. So this is a fluid which is um, thermally conductive but not electrically conductive. So the actual servers, as you can see in the picture on the right, are actually immersed within the fluid and they can actually re reject their heat directly into that fluid, which then transfers that heat into a water-based system. Um, this isn't commonly used at the moment, but and it is quite new within the market, but I, I expect will be used uh, significantly in the future and, and particularly within within um, edge data centres, which will which I'll, I will touch on in, in a moment. Um, just to add, add on to the um, uh, to the type of immersion systems, if these are actually used, what you can actually do is chain um, different server types together and, and all their heat rejection can actually be added to the point where you can start with an, an inlet temperature of between 5 and 20 degrees and, and end up with an outlet temperature for use in district heating networks of, of around 60 degrees centigrade. So this would effectively negate the, the need to have, of any future heat pumps or any heat sources to in, in, in increase that temperature. Um, before we go on to this, I'll, I'll, I'll just touch on, on edge data centres. So at the moment, um, 
most of the data center developments we're working on are in and, and around the London area. And, and that's really driven by the fact that historically banks have all been based in London. They've always had their, their backup data centers look close to London. There's not really a huge amount of large data center development around the rest of the UK. But within the next 10 to 15 years, edge data centers will, will come of age. Now, and, and the edge, as they call it, is effectively a, a, a facilitator of the Internet of Things. I think most people have probably heard about that, that, um, that, that, that concept. And in essence, what it really is, is a, a part of the Internet, which, which is much, much closer to that. The best way I can explain it myself is that when you uh, ask your phone what the weather is or you ask your smart speaker what the weather is today, that piece of technology doesn't actually have that information itself. It has to go away and connect to the Internet to find that that information, relay it back to you and, and then let you have the information. Obviously, as the Internet of Things increases, uh, the, the numbers of tech pieces of technology connecting to the Internet increases, the actual amount of data that is being transmitted between um, across the Internet will increase exponentially. And what they're realising now that if they start at the moment just using these hyperscale data centres all clustered around London to store that information, the Internet will effectively grind to a halt. So an, an edge data centre is, is, a, is a small data centre which is much closer to the user. And, and these data centres will eventually be all over the UK and, and will be able to store information which is commonly required from the hyperscale data centers so that when you ask your phone what the weather is today it goes to that data center which is much closer to you than then going to the hyperscale data center and, and that minimizes the amount of data traffic there is across the network obviously that means that these smaller edge data centers will, will be close to where people live and then they can be used to recover heat from uh, in, 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 in discrete um, dwellings. So um, an example we've come up with is, say, a, a, a residential tower in a city centre location, whereas at the moment you have maybe three or four uh, retail units in the base of the uh, uh, development, you could have three retail units and a small edge data centre. And using immersion cooling, uh, using immersion technology, you can get a very high density of servers in, in, in quite a small location. And from that, you could potentially recover, you know, maybe half a megawatt of heat, which would be enough to, to heat all of the um, apartments above it, you know, making this effectively a, you know, a, 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 a net zero carbon tech, um, building, particularly if renewable technology is used to run the data center. As well as data centers, there are obviously um, a, a number of different types of energy sources that can be used to run these types of ambient loops. Um, I, I put a, I'll put a couple of examples up on the screen for, for you to review um, and all of these are either in use or are or, 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 or in development as we speak. Uh, the first is some um, energy recovery from the tube. So this is an installation that's already in and working. Um, I think Bexley Council recover the waste heat to heat social housing and a couple of local energy centres. Uh, and, and what they effectively do is just take the hot air from the tube, take it through a heat pump and then drop it into their district heating network. Obviously in the summer, the system can actually be reversed. So heat from the ambient air can be taken through the heat pump and cool the air to be then delivered on onto on, on the tube uh, network. I think anyone who's been in London in the summer will realise it can get very uncomfortable in the tube. Um, so yeah, having one of these installed in every in every station would be most welcome. Um, uh, another type of technology is, is is wastewater heat recovery. This is an example of a project in Scandinavia, where they're recovering upwards of six megawatts of heat from a wastewater system. Um, if you think about it, uh, nowadays we even with our own homes we normally heat water to around sixty degrees centigrade. Uh, for Legionella purposes to ensure we don't end up uh, becoming ill. That water is normally delivered to our shower heads at 43 degrees and probably hits the drain at around 33, 30 degrees. So probably half the energy you put into heating hot water goes to drain. If you multiply that by thousands of homes, that's a huge amount of energy that we're effectively throwing away every day. And that water all, all gets collected by the waste uh, by the waste water system and if it can be if energy can be recovered from it that can be put back into a a, a district heating network for reuse um th this particular example is in scampo in, in in this part of the large copenhagen district heating network where they're recovering upwards of six megawatts of heat um almost constantly to, to put back into their district heating network 
Another example, a little bit more closer to home, is the Eden uh, geothermal project. Um, this is one which is actually um, pretty hot off the press, really. Um, they, they've just finished boring a 4.5 kilometre hole in into the uh, granite which underlies the site, where they're hoping to recover um, heat of, uh, up to 190 degrees C um, for both generating heating and, and, and electricity. Um, Cornwall has, has, has an advantage over most of the UK in the fact that because they're an underlain by granite, granite being radioactive means that the, uh, the temperature gradient as you go underground is actually higher than it would be in the rest of the UK. But temperatures of, of up to 100 degrees can be recovered pretty much a, 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 a across the UK. And there are a number of, of schemes already in the planning process uh, to, to recover waste heat uh, from or, or recover even geothermal heat uh, from these types of sources. So, you know, I think this, this gives you a flavour that, you know, it's not just data centres, but other types of waste heat that can be recovered. I've not even touched on um, in, 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 in industrial um, buildings, which obviously can, you know, you, you can recover heat from. Um, and, and what we can try and do is really build this into a, a sustainable and, and livable city. Um, in, in this type of tech context, what we would have is a number of uses within, within a, a, a development. These could be um, offices, shops, homes, obviously, um, and, and using a mix of renewable technologies and energy recovery can make these this whole development almost zero carbon. Um, you can then add other things in. Uh, for example, uh, vertical farms are a relatively new concept in the UK, um, but waste heat from uh, data centres or other types of technology can be used with vertical farms to produce a lot of um, soft fruit and, and salad vegetables all year round. I mean, currently we import a huge amount of these of, of these vegetables from abroad, particularly in the winter. By by growing them close to the to close to demand, we can offset huge amounts of energy and and carbon uh, that that otherwise we would we would have to uh, uh, expend. Um, and and that finishes finishes my presentation. I hope you found it useful, and um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, well, we do have some questions, Chris. Love to put you on the spot with these. Um, no problem. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm I'm conscious with a couple of these that I'm going to ask that you know you are quite familiar with. You know, I've spoken to you many times. Quite familiar with um, data center operators. So, a couple of interesting questions here, putting you on the spot. Uh, I'm going to start with a question from um, Julian Dickens. Julian, thank you for joining us. Um, who says, you know, the reuse uh, of waste heat from data centers sounds like a great idea. Um, Julian's question though is that, it, that one of the challenges is convincing data centre operators that connecting services infrastructure between data centres uh, and adjacent uses uh, won't increase risk of downtime or security weaknesses. So um, how do you go about addressing those sorts of concerns with the data centre operators? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, what we always try to do when we when we design a, 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 a data centre for energy reuse is to ensure that the design of the data centre itself um, is, is foremost in mind. So we will design all of the heat rejection to allow the data centre to work in isolation of, of any of, of any requirement to recover heat. So if for any reason the district heating network goes down, the energy, the energy um, data centre can operate on, on its own. To be honest with you, what we're finding with data center operators is that all of them need to try and become more sustainable. Um, and we find that they are quite happy to um, to to accommodate um, uh, the, 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 these type of ten, of, of, of these type of technologies to enable um, planning applications to be approved. OK, so, yeah, this is a classic case of, you know, technology moving on and thinking about how to separate aspects of that for security and also, you know, organisations realising that, you know, the, their own uh, agenda around sustainability and what have you is very important too. So they need to actually think about these things. Um, there's another question similarly, Chris, here again, in terms of thinking about the data centre operator um, from Lyle Darwin. Um, Lyle, thank you for the for the question. Um, Lyle says, how likely are current data centre clients uh, susceptible to allow the dialectic technology? Is this being specified and designed? Um, Lyle says that um, it's aware of some clients who are sceptical about water cooling within the white space and particularly the IT. So again, I guess, Chris, the question about, you know, how well data centre operators are responding to these challenges. 
Um, yeah, I think his, historically um, adiabatic cooling has been very popular over the last sort of 10 to 15 years because it does provide a very low energy cooling solution. Um, the drive now, to be honest with you, is, is towards a, a, a densification of server applications within the data hall. Um, the cost of actually building data centres and the land values alone are, 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 are massive, particularly in the London area. Um, sites are being sold for upwards of, of £10 million an acre for data centre development. So what developers are looking to try to do is to try and, you know, really, you know, maximise the amount of server servers that they can install. Uh, once you go above, say, loads of around 10 to 15 kilowatts a square metre, um, air doesn't become suitable. To, uh, to to recover the heat, the servers just get over overheat and, and and get too hot. You therefore have to try and use some form of of, of, of water cooling technology um, to try and, to try and reject that heat. Um, th the beauty of dielectric cooling is obviously it is it isn't electrically conductive, so um, you know you don't have any worries of of, of water leaks damaging um, a, a equipment. Um, but yeah, generally I would say at the moment um, immersive cooling technology is probably leading edge. I don't think it's common by any means, um, but I think within the next five to 10 years, due to the drive to densify um, the, the amount of servers installed within a building, uh, people will be driven towards it, the, the, this type of technology. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to try and do another sort of two or three questions before we close. Um, question here, which I think I'm going to I'm going to go to next because it links on to what we've just been talking about. Um, could the same technology be used on a smaller scale? Um, in plant rooms for, say, residential developments, offices, et cetera? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, definitely. Um, you know, as, as I, I mean, just as an example, I worked on a, on a project a number of years ago uh, for Dyson in, in, in Malmesbury and in Wheelchair, and they had a, a four megawatt um, R&D facility that, that we built for them. Um, and as part of the building, there was a little um, 250 kilowatt data center. We recovered the waste heat from that, put it into a ground source array, for reuse in the winter. Um, and that 250 kilowatt data center actually provided some around 80% of the total heating demand for that four megawatt building. I mean, obviously we had um, backup boilers and, and, and backup chillers to manage the peak load, but that data center in the ground source system really maximized the amount of energy that, that, that could be recovered. I mean, that, that building's now been in operation since around 2016. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tried and proven technology that that can be used. OK, yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, question from Alexander, um, which I guess gets a bit more detailed in terms of from a technical perspective. Um, do data centres produce roughly constant heat output or does the heat output vary with the network load? Uh, it really depends upon the, the type of data centre. Yeah, so obviously there will be peaks and troughs in, in demand, which is why when we looked at the um, uh, the the, um, the Langley data center project, we only assumed we could take a fifth of, of the peak IT load uh, as 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 energy at any one time. Um, if you'd imagine if it's a bank data center, obviously this time of year, particularly on a Saturday when people are putting lots of EPOS transaction through the tills, there will be a peak in in server loads. Probably on on an evening when you've got a Netflix data center and everyone is streaming films, there will be a peak in in load there. Um, so yeah, you know, data centres will will, you know, there will be peaks in 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 in, in troughs in load, um, but you know, we try to be conservative when we actually estimate what the energy recovery would be from those those types of buildings, and we will use empirical data wherever possible. Okay, thank you. I'm going to do just a couple more questions before we close, if that's okay. Um, we talked about this the other day. I know um, examples. Are there examples of ambient loops in use at the moment? Yeah, so that there are a couple that, that are in development and, and, have, and have been installed. So uh, South Bank University has had an ambient loop installed for a number of years, basically as, as, as a test bed to, to prove the technology. And that's been uh, proven to be, you know, to work. And it's been in the SIBSI um, journal a number of times over the past few years. Uh, Plymouth uh, Council um, we're planning an, a, a ambient loop connecting up a number of department stores uh, uh, with their, some of their council buildings in, in, in Plymouth City Centre. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that one's um, pro progressed too much further because obviously I think Debenhams in, uh, have, have now gone bankrupt, so probably that the heat, the heat that could be recovered potentially isn't there anymore. But you know, there are certainly a, a number of different types of ambient loop systems that are, are, are currently being developed. I mean, my particular view is people trying to develop high temperature district heating networks nowadays probably are being slightly misguided with the fact that, you know, if we need to move away from fossil fuels, 
we won't be able to generate those high temperatures which those systems are, are, are based upon and we need to look at lower temperature systems such as data centers or other types of renewable energy that we can use to fire those um, types of systems in the future. Okay and, and Chris let's have one sort of big final wrap-up question if I may. Um, you know in terms of everything you've described today why aren't we doing more of this already and, and what do uh, developers, there will be some developers on this webinar today. What do developers need to be thinking? I, I think, to be honest with you, the, the reason behind why we've not ad 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 adopted it um, so far is, 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 is probably partly legislation, I think, because, you know, we haven't been driven to effectively develop and build zero carbon multi-use developments. I think we've always been focused very much on buildings in the UK. And we've always been consumers of energy. We, we've been, you know, really we've been trapped in the use of, of 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 natural gas for a number of years now, particularly since the 1970s when, when it came on stream. And we've just assumed that we can connect into the gas network to fire our buildings. And we've looked to drive down the the um, the, the energy use within the buildings. But you know, moving away from fossil fuels will, will drive us towards you know having to adopt these these type of of, of, of technologies. Um, I would like to think that both developers and, and local authorities should be able to work together to to develop you know the, 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 these type of solutions, um, which will you know again you know drive us you know taking taking it back to my first my, my first slide really trying to make a a holistic solution. So, from a planning perspective, you know local authorities should be able to look at trying to you know bring mi mixed use type developments together you know wh which will allow you know energy to be recovered locally i mean at the moment most data centers are in industrial sites well away from any any types of um, energy consumers that that would that, that, that could utilize the um the energy and and that that has to change to allow you know the users and the, the producers and, and, and the consumers to be to be brought together OK, thank you, Chris. Um, that was perfect. I'm going to keep it tight because everybody has busy days. That's kept us to half an hour. Um, Chris, thank you so much for your time today. And um, thank you to uh, our audience and your questions as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we will share a recording of this as well and the slides. Um, uh, so uh, it just me to say um, thank you for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye bye.